Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's very, really a pleasure to be here and to talk about this great challenge that's happening in the labor market today. So I'll be speaking a bit of the labor market evolution as we see it from the perspective where we are at the Smart uh, Cooperative, is we're kind of on the fringe of where a lot of transformation are, are happening and we see a diversity of work situation that I want to present to you from this perspective at least. <clears throat> <laughs> you can go for that. So yeah, we have a unique observatory and I'm going to explain to you why in a second. So <clears throat> the main drivers that we see in the labor market evolutions that have been starting about 40 years ago, actually now, of course, we know it all. There's the question of the globalization, the lean production, the externalization of services. Um, but I think another huge transformation is the fact that we went from an industrial economy to a service economy. In fact, almost all our members are from the service economy. And these two trends have made it that the, the labor market, uh, sorry, no, the uh, enterprise landscape is that we have more than 95% actually of enterprises that are micro enterprises, which gives, it, it changes the relationship of what an, an employer is compared to when you have a huge multinational or a huge uh, um, industry. Then, of course, there's the democratization of work. Um, the population has never been so educated in Europe, at least as today. I'm, I'm also speaking from a European perspective. Um, and then there's the reduction of production costs, which are linked to uh, the changes in production tools um, that Magda was just uh, um, presenting earlier. And of course, we've been talking about it, I could hear it this morning too, there's a flexibilization of labor market policies and the digitalization and uh, the impact of uh, artificial intelligence, which, for which we're just at the beginning actually of this process. But, and sometimes, and often uh, it is set aside, but there are also new aspirations at work. And I really think that it's linked to the digitalization to generations that have been, had grown up with internet, which I think changes your whole perspective on what you can do, what authority is, and who's giving you the right information and so on. Not always for the best, but it does change a lot. Next, please. Um, so the consequences is that in Europe, at least, we do have 60% of the labor market who are in standard forms of employment, full-ended, open-ended contract, open contracts, of course. But then between these and the classical liberal professions uh, in the self-employment, you have a huge gray zone of employment with a wide variety of situations. And it's very difficult to, to, to draw a clear portrait at what this population is. We do know that 10% more or less are self-employed, of which two-thirds are solo self-employed and are more at risk of poverty than the other self-employed. We have 15% of alternative, for, alternative forms of employment. So here we are talking about people who are in temp agencies, people who work in short-term contracts, uh, a whole variety of situations where you have um, salaried workers, uh, but in non-standard forms of employment of which a very uh, fast growing populations, which are the slash workers. So slash workers are people who have different jobs. I am journalist slash uh, um, cashier slash <laughs> whatever. Um, and this is a fast growing population. We could really see that in the last decade in particular. And there is a strong link between these workers and the platform workers, actually. They uh, participate in having more platform workers and the platforms actually uh, help these workers to, 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 to diversify their, their careers and, and work opportunities. So when I'm going to be talking about freelancers, I'm going to be talking about this whole... <laughs> part of the labor market, but um, not, for example, temp agencies. I'm going to be talking about people who have autonomy or at least a certain degree of autonomy in their work. Either they can negotiate well, they have a, a control over the whole production process. I mean, there are different strands of autonomy. I'm not saying that they're totally autonomous on everything, but they do have some aspects of autonomy and they're in that zone and it's very difficult to qualify, quantify. Sorry. So they can be, if we're talking in legal terms, either salaried workers who are working on short-term contracts or, uh, for example, uh, in open-ended contract but through different clients, for example, in the Cooperative d'Activité d'Emploi in France, or you have the solo self-employed. So these are how you can find them statistically. But as I said, it's very difficult to identify them precisely. <clears throat> 
So SMART started out, uh, well, SMART today is a shared structure. It's a cooperative and it enables workers, entrepreneurs, and the freelancers I've been talking about to de develop their activities autonomously while minimizing risks and by mutualizing uh, various services. Um, we all, we try to offer also the best social protection for these, uh, for these workers, knowing that they're not in classical employment, which is the most protective. So in, in most countries, I'm gonna talk from the Belgian perspective, but uh, we are active in different countries and we always try to salary the workers because that is the best social protection. So who are these freelancers that we um, support? Um, they, so we are an open cooperative, so there's no um, preconditions to uh, be part of the cooperative. Um, so we, we have people who want to make a living out of a skill or know-how. Uh, they want to uh, obtain regular or occasional uh, income from their know-how. Um, usually they are working in the artistic or intellectual or craft services. We're really in the gray, uh, no, not the gray, I'm sorry, the knowledge economy sector, mostly, but not only. And the sectors are very wide. We were created, we started out for freelance artists. And then over time, we opened up to the creative sector and then to all the sex service sectors that I've been uh, explaining here. About half of our members are still in the creative sector. So that's artists, um, graphic designers, technicians in the arts, and there's this gray zone of translators and journalists are in the creative economy or not. It's a big question. Um, and then there's all the new service. Sergio Bologna speaks a lot about these new services relatively new, uh, that are linked also to the new media technology. So we have people who are in IT, uh, consultants, people who are in training, um, but also a lot of people who are in well-being because um, these sectors have really developed, you know, yoga teachers, Pilates teachers, whatever. <laughs> There's a lot of these people and um, who are in these types of careers. And, and I'll come back to that uh, later on. We've also um, supported at one point some platform workers, but I'll come back on that point. <clears throat> so what is the commonalities of all these people? Because they're quite a broad spectrum here. Um, they develop multiple skills and jobs. 80% of our members have different jobs within the cooperative or by juggling in within the cooperative and outside the cooperative. Um, they undertake different roles. So for example, if you take uh, an artist, uh, he can be leading an artistic project and he'll be hiring other people, but sometimes he'll be working for someone else. So that's changing roles also in the attitude at work and sometimes in the responsibilities as well. They have multiple clients. And when it comes to the artistic sector and, and uh, consultants, they are also highly mobile in their work, uh, which complexifies even more all the legal and administrative uh, processes that they have to take into, into account and handle with. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are the main challenges of these people? And these, this is the, the solutions that we've been trying to, to, to provide to these workers. So the challenges are finding clients, getting paid, and, but also on time, um, doing things all on your own. You, when you are a freelancer, you have to organize your prospection, your communication, you have to get the job done, you have to uh, deal with all the legal and administrative stuff. And it's a lot of competences that, and skills that the, the worker has to develop beyond the actual job that he has to have or she. And increasingly, what we also see is irregular income, um, having to pay insurances uh, or social protection following the countries. But the problem is that often they have a low and an uneven access to social protection, especially when you're in, in an insurance-based type of uh, social protection model. So insurance base will be something where, for example, your unemployment will be calculated on how much you've earned and worked before. So, uh, and not uh, because you have a certain status and more. So how do we provide solutions to these workers? We have two main services, two main uh, support to their activity. The first one is a very simple contract. The freelancer is going to negotiate, find its clients, negotiate terms and conditions, um, pricing and so on. They're gonna, we have a platform and the worker can, the freelancer can write that uh, on, uh, on our, these information on the platform. We simplify all the legal and administrative aspects for them. 
that, that makes um, ooh, the, um, uh, an order form that has to be signed by the client. Once it's signed by the client, we can invoice the client. We're going to pay the social contribution and do all the taxations for the freelancers. We're going to pay also the worker within seven working days, regardless that if the client has paid or not, because this is a really huge issue for freelancers. And we're going to make him uh, all the documents related to work available on a platform, uh, his personal unit, of course, um, accessible uh, seven, seven, yeah seven days a week. The other one really allows the, the, the freelancer to function as if he, he or she had its own enterprise. So basically, um, same thing, the freelancer has to find um, his clients, his opportunities, but there's different ways of getting the money inside his or her own account within SMART, her legal entity, well, not legal entity, her, his or her um, small enterprise, which is within the shared enterprise, they can be uh, invoices, it can be financial agreements. So for example, if in your arts sector, you might have some subsidies and stuff like that, um, that support your work or intellectual property rights. And from there, you can, you can work either alone, you can also hire other people, um, and then you can declare expenses because taxation is quite different, and you can also get the, uh, the money out as intellectual property uh, rights. Yep. So what the model provides is that we, we ask a fee of 6.5%, and through this, and also a return on taxation at the cooperative level, we can mutualize services. And along the years, we're able to provide our members with clear information, legal support, personalized advice, uh, financing instruments, uh, also support to cash flow, like for example, the guarantee fund is a cash flow support. Um, Co-working in third spaces, we've developed a bit in, uh, in all, everywhere where we have have offices and we also provide them with training um, and opportunities to professionalize like networking and so on. <clears throat> So this is why we consider ourselves as a shared enterprise. They are really plugging in to this uh, bigger um, cooperative. It's a really a pragmatic answer um, to the social and economic challenges of our society, the ones I've been explaining earlier on the labor market, um, and especially made for people who are autonomous. So really, it's almost like you know shared cars. You, everybody doesn't have to have their own car. You can share cars. Well, here is this way, but at a more economic development development level. Yep. So, as I said, we, we were born in Belgium, uh, actually as a non-profit organization in 1998, and we grew uh, um, in Belgium, but also in different countries. We are present in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Austria, in Germany, in Sweden, and Netherlands, that's it. With very, these are countries with very different legal frameworks and social protection models. And um, so it's, it was also quite, always quite a challenge to adapt to these. But nevertheless, you see that there are a lot of commonalities for these workers, whatever the legal framework, on a macro level, of course, I'm not talking about the details. <laughs> <clears throat> and so we, we also service uh, tens of thousands of uh, freelancers every year. That's okay. <laughs> you can go. Um, so where's the social innovation in here? Well, basically, we're providing a solution for these people, as I said, that are in gray zone of employment. But we're also trying to bring together two things that are in our social protection models are totally <laughs> separate, which is autonomy and solidarity. We allow the workers to be autonomous in the way they work, just as if they were self-employed. But we provide them with a double solidarity, the one linked to mutualization of means within the cooperative, but also the one linked to the legal status. Um, it's, why is it interesting? It's an alternative model to being a self-employed when you think of uh, all the, the risk of poverty or even self-employed people in poverty, it's, uh, it's quite alarming. Um, it's also about creating, it's avoiding to create your own business with all the hassle it has. Once again, if you look at the rate of um, survival of new companies after five years, it's it's not that great. And um, it's also about contributing to the wider social solidarity, providing funds for the salaried workers, paying the social contribution, but also having access to that solidarity. Um, what's interesting is that this model really uh, fits a lot of profiles. I, meant it, I, I mentioned it before, but when we analyzed our members, what we saw was a few different categories. So you have people who are freelancers who really want to do these different jobs and they chose it and they do it either part-time or full-time. 
uh, often they actually have a part-time job as a salaried worker elsewhere to ensure the security of income. Some are entrepreneurs, they want to grow, they want to hire people. Uh, others are simply intermittent workers, so people who have a job that they love, but if they want to do it, they have no other choice than to be in these careers. If you think of artists, uh, it's very difficult to have an open-ended contract with an organization. Um, most of the, the, the arts that we, we, we consume is done by freelancers. Um, we also have uh, people who are casual workers, so people who just have a hobby and once in a while they manage to sell it, uh, I don't know, at a Christmas market, <laughs> and they don't want to, 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 to develop uh, their enterprise or to be a self, uh, self-employed, so they can just once a year uh, declare this work here. So that really reduces the informal uh, work on this point. But also very interesting, we have people who are post-growth workers. Those are people who have um, <clears throat> understood the environmental challenges that we're facing, and they want to do something about it. And they want to do so by being careful of how they consume. They want to have more time to do stuff on their own, to be activists, um, to, to, to grow. And so they decide to earn less, to spend less, and have more time, quality time. And this is still a minority, but we're seeing it's growing. And it was interesting to see that through the research that we have through our members. And I think with these are workers we also have to take into consideration. Um, so yeah, digital platforms. Um, as I said, we have an online tool and we have tens of thousands of members in Belgium. So we don't necessarily know all the clients. We can go find them out. But at one point we realized that hundreds of our workers had a client, which was Deliveroo. And then at the time, Take It Easy, which was another food delivery platform. And we didn't really understand how they work, but we could see that it was not compatible with our model. And therefore we asked the workers, how, how, what was this client doing? How was it functioning? And we understood that either we would they had to stop working with them, with us at least, or we could try and negotiate things. And this is the only time where we actually did a commercial agreement with a client, but that actually acts as a collective agreement somehow, uh, informally, because we were able to negotiate that the writers would be paid by the hour and not by the delivery, that they would have minimum three-hour shifts, that they would be reimbursed for the use of their tools, that is the bikes and the cell phones, and, um, and also they would have access to the security and training uh, before the first ride. And of course, all this meant that they also accessed our insurance. We have a, a specific insurance for all our members for accident against accidents at work, and that extended to private life because when people these freelancers are working, they're not always paid, <laughs> and normal insurances would only accept that they would be covered when they're being paid under contract. But there's all this invisible work uh, before and after that has to be taken into consideration as well. Um, so we we managed to do this. It, it, it functioned from 2015. Uh, Take It Easy went bankrupt quite quickly, I think after two months, not because of us, simply <laughs> <laughs> simply they didn't get enough investment because, you know, this is a market where investors try these different platforms, but they know there's going to be one winner. And at one point they see if one's not strong enough, they just won't invest anymore. And that's what happened to Take It Easy. What happened? Of, of all the people who were working for that Take It Easy, restaurants, writers, uh, only our members were the ones who were paid. And it was like for two weeks work worth, it was like almost 400,000 euros. So it's not peanuts. But mutualization shows that it didn't rock our boat. And we were very proud actually to be able to pay these workers. And then uh, Deliveroo stopped in uh, 2008, January 2018 officially to work uh, with us because they decided that uh, the, they didn't need to actually. Politically, I think that it was dangerous for them to know that the writers could actually be salaried for one. And secondly, but mo maybe most important, there was also change in legislation in Belgium, which meant that they didn't need salaried workers anymore. I can go into detail that after if you want, but it's the details. So, so legal frameworks so, are crucial actually when it comes to labor. So now I want to concentrate a little bit more on the cooperative solutions. When it comes to these digital platform workers, uh, we believe that platform co-ops are really an interesting solution because it's a model that uses technology for human-driven economy. I mean, with the, all these platforms have been running and we never ask ourselves, what, are we, what does the society need how can technology be useful to society? No, it's only the business who took care of this. So I think we have to rethink that a little bit. 
And the cooperative model is a way to rethink that. Um, it's also interesting because it, it, it allows democracy at work in a different way. Um, in a co platform co-op, the members of the co-op decide how the value is going to be generated, captured, and redistributed. In the multi-stakeholder co-op particularly, it can be a very interesting model when you think, uh, because it opens up not only to the workers of the platforms, but also to all the ecosystem that is impacted by the platform. If you think, for example, of um, Airbnb, if we would... There are some alternative platforms to that. And there you can have who? You can have not only the people who rent the houses, the people who go to the houses, but you could also have the city because it has an impact. These platforms have an impact on the housing process as well. So you have all the people around the table who can really think of how this is functioning. And it allows to have all the points of view around the table while also thinking about the sustainability of the platform also, of course. Um, yeah. And it requires, of course, a, a strong governance. So if we take the cooperative principles, um, there's a voluntary and open membership. And I think that these cooperative principles are really interesting, especially when we're at moment of change in the labor market. In fact, if historically, if you look at it, cooperatives always appeared when there was a major change, the uh, first industrial revolution. So, they, they, the workers reorganize. They see that they are, are, are losing income, that they're losing rights, so they organize on their own. And I think that right now is a very, and it's not only that I think, we see that there's a boom in the cooperative world in all sectors of activities, food, uh, manufacturing, technology, and so on. And what are the basic principles? Voluntary and open membership. It means you can't ask people monetarily to be a cooperator. Democratic member control, that means the members truly have to have a control on how things are uh, managed in the cooperative. Um, there's a member economic participation. Members can be very diverse. It can be individuals, but it can also be structures. Autonomy and, and independence. It means that a cooperative cannot be dependent on public uh, authority or only one company, for example. There are different types of cooperatives. Education, training, uh, and information are a crucial aspect of the cooperative uh, to their members. Um, cooperation among cooperatives is another um, aspect. And uh, of course, the concern uh, for community. And I think this is where it's also very interesting for the challenges that we have today. In the workers' co-op, in particular, democratic governance is very interesting. Of course, workers are shareholders, um, um, but they, so that means that they integrate different role. Not only are they the workers and they have access to, to, to workers' rights, but they also have in mind the issues of the company itself. So they're also owners and they can have a say on, on how the uh, co-op is going to evolve. The democratic pr uh, process is central um, to bridge the, dif the different roles between the worker and the owner. It, there, it can be sometimes a bit schizophrenic. <laughs> um, um, to also to certify that the production tools and the values are in the hands of the worker. Um, and they also, a democratic governance really allows workers to, uh, in a worker cooperative, to validate the fundamental functioning of the cooperative, but also to design its evolution and its strategic development. So, um, also a very important aspect, and we've seen that this has helped the cooperatives in the resilience, uh, economic resilience, both in 2008, but also today, and the crisis that we are living today, is that benefits go back to the cooperative. Um, and, it's, and that's what makes them more solid. They don't have to pay back the investors. The investors are the community that are creating this cooperative. So it makes it more sustainable and more human-driven globally. Thank you. Um, in our model, um, we, of course, are in line with the International Cooperative Alliance principles. Uh, the members are stakeholders. There is a participatory governance. Oh, I am. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> there is democracy. There is one person, one vote, and there is no dividends. So people have to buy a shareholder if they're cooperate, cooperators, but they can only get it back if they leave the cooperate, cooperative. And there's no added value on these shares. Um, in this, in our multi, uh, we are a multi-stakeholder cooperative. Um, we are actually uh, the legal status in Belgium because in every country it's very different. Cooperative society. We are a cooperative society accredited accredited as a social enterprise. It's a very brand new status in Belgium. Uh, the cooperative law has changed uh, two years ago. 
Um, we also develop commons, and this is what I think is interesting in the cooperative and it's crucial in the policy to be developed in the 21st century is creating commons. That means a good to be preserved by the community for the community. The commons in our case would be the cooperative per se, the shared enterprise, the guarantee fund, which allows us to pay the members um, in uh, timely, and also the third spaces that we create. I don't know if you're familiar with third spaces, but it's more than co-working. It's really places where everybody can come. Just to give you an example, um, at the uh, entrance in, uh, at our offices in Belgium, there's this huge room where anybody can come with a computer and anybody can grab a coffee. I mean, we have neighbors who have nothing to do with the co-op <laughs> who come and grab a coffee and might have a meeting with friends there too. And it's possible. It's third space. Spaces, it's open spaces to everybody. It's open, yep. Well, from nine to five. <laughs> um, yeah, and so our model really provide helps to that the cooperative keeps the economic most of the economic risk and the solidarity is provided to the members and the workers. And we've also worked a lot since we've became a cooperative on the democratic uh, participation and governance. So. <clears throat> we have, I said, we're multi-stakeholder co-op. We have three uh, type of uh, stakeholders. We have the category A, which are the freelancers, which is the wide majority of our of, uh, of, of our community, let's say, and they uh, they can be they count for three fifths of the board. There's the permanent workers like me, people who are paid by Smart to provide the services, and then there's the other category, which are the partners with whom we work. Um, the most interesting, I think, is the category A, because really they have to endorse three different roles. They are co-owners. I said of the, uh, they have a share, the shares at the cooperatives, and that gives them a right of vote. But they're also the economic developers. They're the one who find their clients. They are the entrepreneurs. But they are also the workers, salaried workers, employees employed by the cooperative. <clears throat> Sorry, no <laughs> problem. No, I won't. Uh, and the democratic governance, as I was saying, is crucial. I'm almost at the end. <laughs> there's the General Assembly, of course. Um, there's the fact that people can be uh, um, elected at the board of members. <clears throat> but there's also, and that's, I think, the most interesting part, it's the Smart in Progress. These are working groups that happen every year on th specific themes where members, I mean, all the stakeholders discuss what are we going to do. So it's not just you vote at the General Assembly, yes, no, for something. You also design. This is what we need. We need an ethical committee. We need a central a purchasing central for a member. We need this or that. And then the cooperative, uh, it has to be validated by the General Assembly, of course, but then it's implemented uh, over the years. We, um, so as I'm running a bit late, sorry. Oh, no, great. Policy takeaways. Here we are. <laughs> so from our view, um, what has to be tackled when we're thinking of uh, if we want to handle this diversification and also segmentation of the labor market, these are what we always advocate for. First of all, no third employment status. It's already complicated enough with two. <laughs> if we make three, it's just going to make more gray zones. And there's no exception for platform workers. For us, platform workers are just an, an extreme extension of the policies and the evolutions of the labor market. But it's not because they're, did, they're working on a platform that it's any different. They are still workers, and they're still working here in the real life as well. Um, we have to maintain the rights, les acquis, as we say in French, of the standard employment. But to do that, we also have to reinforce the social protection of all the other workers, including the self-employed workers and all the non-standard forms of employment. We have to make sure that no one works under cost, because what's happening now is that we have a lot of, uh, of self-employed workers who are being paid under cost, actually. And what does it mean to be paying, uh, paying people at cost? It means covering the hours of work, of course, but also covering the tools that they need and also the social protection that they need, be it private or public, those have to be covered. And what we see in the platform economy is that these workers are not aware that they are being, <laughs> that they're not covering all that. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, we also believe that we have to align costs of workers too. So taxation and social contribution have to to, 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 to be closer, whatever the social status in which you're working. Otherwise, there's still going, always going to be this race to the bottom in terms of price and working conditions. Um, and we also believe that cooperatives uh, are really interesting to address these challenges of work. Um, 
as I said, because it's a human-centered economy, it's not a profit-driven economy, it can take into account the labor market evolution, especially the gray zone of employment. This is what we've done, uh, and there's other models all over Europe, actually. It's not only SMART. There's in Finland and France and Italy as well. We've known other organizations who have similar uh, solutions. Um, it really is also about renewing democratic practices within the workplace, because this is something that we, ha we, we haven't gone far enough, we believe, in the economy today. Um, and then uh, it also is a way of tackling environmental and social challenges within the enterprise by taking into consideration all uh, stakeholders. Um, and yeah, it's also a way of taming the negative effects of digital, pla uh, digital platforms, as I mentioned, with the platform co-op model. But these cooperatives have three challenges. It's economic, it's less interesting for investors, uh, and so there's a competition challenge here to get money uh, to start. Legally, um, the structures that internalize environmental and social costs are more expensive than those who are only profit-driven. So here, we, I think we have a, a huge work to do in our legal, in our, in our accountancy, and our, our fiscal systems to make sure that we actually promote the organization that internalized these costs rather than making them, um, giving them a competitive disadvantage, because this is what's happening today. Um, yep, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you.